So we're going to get, go ahead and get started with uh, this month's this month's Launchpad lecture. Um, a couple of reminders: make sure your cell phones are silent. So it's kind of a movie theater thing, although we don't have a really nice video, you know, going up with actors and actresses. And please hold all questions until the end. Um, I'm going to try and get through the presentation in a reasonable amount of time today. There's a ton of slides with this one, a lot um, that we're going to be going through. Uh, and then I'm actually supposed to be in a division director's meeting starting up at quote unquote 10 o'clock, although I've got permission to go there a little bit late. Um, uh, so we'll see how much time for Q&A we've got. But in any case, um, uh, we're going to be talking about Apollo 17, the last steps on the moon. Uh, as always, I am Chris Orwall. Um, I am still the director here at the New Mexico Museum of Space History. Um, I always start off with a quote. In this situation, I love this one from Gene Cernan. Reminds me of, has anybody seen the Big Bang Theory where Buzz Aldrin actually made a little bit of fun of himself? Where he was handing out Halloween candy to the kids, you know, this is a Mars bar, <laughs> Mars is a planet, you know, and, it, and eventually he gets, this is a Milky Way, I'm an astronaut, what did you, or I walked on the moon, what have you done? So, which is absolutely hilarious, and I love that he made fun of himself with that one, but Gene Cernan actually, this is a great quote, I walked on the moon, what can't? Okay, in any case though, background on me, I grew up in Downey, California where they built these things, the Apollo Command and Service Module, the Apollo Space Shuttle, so I was loosely associated, in other words, I knew that there was a space program. Growing up, my earliest memories are doing this during Apollo 11. Um, that is me having just shaken John Young's hand, and there I am, so, yeah. With my mom right here, who took me to all of the uh, astronauts' visits when they came. So sadly, she just passed away a couple of months ago. Went to the Naval Academy, graduated in 1986, drove these around for a while. Had a really great, great conversation once with Buzz Aldrin sitting on one side and Charlie Duke sitting on the other about how submarines and spaceships are just basically exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. You're surrounded by, you're in a living in a tube with your own environment, surrounded by an environment that's trying to kill you. The only difference was the way you died. <laughs> In any case, though, and then I uh, went and ran the Kansas Cosmosphere and Space Center after retiring from the Navy in 2006, did that for almost six years, and then came down here. I have nine kids. This picture was taken a while, but I still use this picture. In fact, actually, this one's 30, this one's 14. Um, now. So this picture was taken quite a while ago, needless to say, but I use this picture because I sent my family to space. So, and that is actually a picture up on the space station. Um, and by the way, that is Steve Bowen. He's going to be flying again on one of the SpaceX rockets up to the space station and spending six months up there um, this next spring. And hopefully, if NASA approves it, um, we are going to be doing another downlink with them, with some of the education um, folks around here. So that will be exciting next year. In any case, though, we've been celebrating or we've been talking about, we've been giving lectures on all of the 50th Apollo um, uh, anniversary mission uh, kind of summaries, etc. So, in any case, this month we're doing Apollo 17. Gene Cernan was the commander of that mission. Set on the lunar surface, it's our destiny to explore, it's our destiny to be a spacefaring nation. Okay, so the Apollo program, just a reminder, of Saturn V rocket, but, and then here's our intrepid crew of this mission. We've got Gene Cernan right here, Ron Evans, who is the commander, excuse me, Ron Evans, who is the command module pilot. And then Jack Schmidt, who was the lunar module pilot. So he and Gene are the ones who walked to the moon, and Ron Evans was the one who operated the command module that was orbiting the, uh, um, orbiting the moon, uh, waiting for them to come back up. So, If we look at the history of the Apollo program, originally this was the seven-step plan. Now, this was the revision of it, and it got revised again very significantly. But the idea was is that you had unmanned tests, then you had the unmanned lunar module in lunar orbit. So this was testing the Saturn V. Then you had the manned Earth orbit flight of the command and service module, Apollo 7, that happened October 1968. The manned Earth orbit flight, um, Apollo 8. So it was supposed to be an Earth orbit flight, but it ended up being a lunar orbit flight because NASA threw that Hail Mary. And then lunar module and elliptical medium Earth orbit, Apollo 9. So, and this is when they tested the lunar module for the first time. Um, the, the, like I said, this was the original kind of schedule and then the revision. So um, e, the E mission was canceled because Apollo 8 early, uh, already flew. And then the, the command service module, lunar module, this was the F mission, Apollo 10 in May 69, and then the lunar landing. That's what was supposed to happen going up to Apollo 11. So the sites where we landed, 11 right here, 12, 13, 
didn't land, very obviously. 14 right here, 15 right here, 16 right here, 17 right here. The Mar Imbrium right here, um, and then this is the Taurus Litro Valley um, uh, it, with the islands right around there. And we'll get into talking about that a bit. If you're curious what the red things are, that's where the Luna, the Russian programs, the Soviet programs, that's where their landers had landed. And then the yellow ones are where we had surveyor spacecraft that landed. So the Apollo program, we're used to seeing this. Like I said, the Saturn V, just remember, we always go back to the nugget that is New Mexico at the very beginning. This was the first launch of the Apollo program, a little Joe 2, like the one out here, and that was used to do the escape testing. That was launched here in New Mexico. And here it is, doing its launching. Okay, the astronauts who flew on the missions. So we had the original group of astronauts selected in the 1950s, the Mercury 7 astronauts. Not going to go into them in great detail here, but they were the first group of astronauts. Then we had our second group of astronauts, the new nine, that were selected in 1962. Some famous names among in there, you know, Neil Armstrong in there, etc. Um, but then we had group three. This is where we have the first of our astronauts for this mission. And there you've got Gene Cernan right there. So in 1963, Gene Cernan was selected as one of the astronauts. Interestingly enough, he and Ron Evans, Ron Evans, who also flies in this mission, were finalists for the selection in this group. Both were naval aviators. Both had gone through the selection process, made it to the final group. Sadly, they both got called out of the training sessions that they were in at that time. Gene got a call from the head of the astronaut office, Deke Slayton. Ron got a call from one of the other administrators with NASA, thanking him for his application and telling him that he didn't make it. So, but needless to say, since he flies, we know that he does make it eventually. In 1965, NASA, at the behest of the science community, selected a group of scientist astronauts. So, and this is the group of five scientist astronauts, most of whom did eventually fly. Jack Schmidt, our, other, our lunar module pilot and our fellow moonwalker on this mission, was selected with that group, and he is end up, ends up being the first of that group to get selected for a mission and the first of that group to fly as well. And we're going to get into his background as well, because he's got a New Mexico connection, if you didn't know that somehow. So 1966, Group 5, the original 19, that was their nickname, because you'd had the new 9, you'd had the, yeah, they all kind of gave themselves nicknames, they still do. Um, in any case, though, Ron Evans, right here, so was selected in 1966. Um, he went back out, was flying again um, with the Navy. Uh, he was a Vietnam um, combat pilot, um, flying F-8s um, for, the, for the Navy. Uh, and NASA made sure that he got an invitation, he was a finalist for the last one, got an invitation for the next selection process as well. And he was selected um, with this group and some, you know, um, a number of these folks very obviously flew, walked on the moon, um, were command module pilots, etc. Okay, so that timeline, I took you up to Apollo 11. Now, this is what they were looking at. So, the, 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 and you see these designations here, H missions. These were the, the lunar landing missions, but they weren't the significant science missions that were the J missions, the later ones that were planned, that were going to have the lunar rover, the more significant science experiments package, etc. So Apollo 12 was supposed to be an H1, um, lands at the Ocean of Storms, the Surveyor 3 site. We know it grabs pieces of the Surveyor spacecraft and brings those back to Earth along with other science. Apollo 13 was supposed to land in the Frau Moro Highlands. Oops, a little problem happens with that. That doesn't happen, a successful failure. 14 was supposed to land at the Litro Crater, 15 the Censorius Crater, 16 Descartes Highlands, 17 Marius Hills, 18 Copernicus Crater, 19 Hadley Rill, 20 Tycho Crater, the Surveyor 7 site. Well, we know that in Jan in, on the 2nd of January 1970, Apollo 20 was canceled because they were planning on these follow-on programs. They only had 15 Saturn V rockets. So they had a limited number that had been contracted to be built. And the money was already out there for those. So Apollo 20 got turned into Skylab because they wanted to do the Skylab program. Well, you need the whole rocket for that because you're going to turn one big section of it into the Skylab um, space station. So in any case, so Apollo 20 became Skylab. Then in April 70, hmm, <laughs> That's when Apollo 13 is supposed to happen. We know that doesn't occur. That doesn't land on the moon. So the Frau Moro Highlands, I misspelled it here, sorry about that, gets reassigned to another mission. Um, and so they lose that. So now, now you've taken away another one of these ones down here that was supposed to go to another location. Um, and then eventually in September of 1970, 
the H-4 and the J-4 missions are canceled. What really that means is that Apollo 19 and Apollo 18 get canceled in September of 1970. It doesn't mean necessarily that this mission right here got canceled, but they turned 15 into a J mission. So they shifted everything up and they canceled 18 and 19. The first of the scientist astronauts that had been assigned was Jack Schmidt, and he'd been assigned to be backup on Apollo 15. Now, the normal way that the Apollo crews worked is if you did backup on one mission, three missions later you were prime crew. That was the rotation, you know, and that's just the way, the way that it worked, and it was the best way for the timing. Um, and so if you take a look at the crews and you go back through with 12, 13, 14, etc., you'll see that backup and then the primary crew coming up three missions later. And so um, the Apollo 15 um, uh, crew, which was supposed to be led by um, Dick Gordon, uh, obviously their mission gets canceled. The science community gets a little nervous. They want one of the scientist astronauts to fly on the Apollo lunar, lunar missions. So that creates a bit of a crew issue, and I'll get into that here in a little bit. So just want to give you the background. So January 1971, we know that the Apollo 14 crew flies. We talked about, you know, Al Shepard leads that crew. And 15 is the backup for that one, led by Dick Gordon, and Harrison Schmidt is on that crew. Um, here's the, ba here's the, uh, the, the backup crew um, of, excuse me, of, sorry, I had 15, 15 um, uh, was the one with Harrison Schmidt on it, 14. Um, the backup crew was led by Gene Cernan, Ron Evans was the command module pilot, and Joe Engel was the lunar module pilot. Kansas astronaut here, he had two Kansas astronauts, strangely enough, on that, uh, on that mission. In any case, though, Joe Engel is supposed to be the, uh, the lunar module pilot, and he was one of the, uh, the previous groups of astronauts. I just mentioned that, that 18 gets canceled. There's the whole discussion of, you know, um, uh, is, you know, what's going to happen. Gene Cernan is the commander for the mission, um, and one of the things that uh, occurs during this time frame when they're looking at it, Gene Cernan actually crashes a helicopter, and I'll show you some pictures. Um, uh, he's trying to do low altitude flights as part of the testing, and they do attribute it to pilot error. Uh, and so there is debate in NASA about um, uh, whether or not, you know, are they going to take the Apollo 15 backup crew and make them Apollo 17, which would put Schmidt into Apollo 17, or are they going to leave Cernan and Evans on it, take Engel off, and put Schmidt in his place? And so this, you know, this is a big debate, and, and yeah, there's, there's some significant people who are not in favor of Gene being in command of that mission. Needless to say, we do know that eventually the decision is going to be made that Gene and uh, Ron Evans are going to be the prime crew for Apollo 17. Joe Engel does get pulled off, um, and uh, uh, Harrison Schmidt gets put onto it. Um, Gene Cernan, uh, astronaut, is, is born up in the in Chicago area, grows up there, goes to Purdue, an ROTC scholarship, becomes a naval aviator, um, uh, and he's right there in case you're curious. Um, flying out of the fleet in many different aircraft. Master's degree from Naval Postgraduate School. Once again, interestingly enough, he and Rod Evans go to the Naval Postgraduate School at the same time. You see a lot of parallels in their two, two careers, very interestingly enough. And uh, uh, married, uh, one daughter, eh, later after NASA divorces, stepdaughters and anything, but this is the, the, his daughter when he flies, Tracy. Her name matters because there's a rock named after her, and you'll see that rock um, uh, during the mission. Um, uh, in any case, though, but here he is with his wife of that time. So uh, he flew on Gemini. Um, he flew on Gemini 9. Wasn't supposed to be the prime crew for Gemini 9. This is starting to sound a little familiar. But the prime crew for Gemini 9 crashed their T-38 into the, uh, to the uh, building where the uh, uh, spacecraft were being built. And uh, um, so the backup crew, which was Tom Stafford and Gene Cernan, get, got moved up to the prime crew. He does fly on Apollo. Before this, he flies on Apollo 10 as the lunar module pilot uh, in the Snoopy spacecraft, along with Tom Stafford, once again. So, and they are the mission that flies the lunar module to the moon and does everything except for take the lunar module all the way down to the lunar surface. Ron Evans, um, a KU graduate, Naval ROTC. Um, uh, he grows up in Kansas, so I should, should have brought that up. So, um, and then uh, uh, NROTC, 
Navy, F-8 uh, pilot, F-8 instructor, test pilot, um, gets selected for NASA, Naval Postgraduate School, electrical engineering degree. So married to Jan, who he stayed married to his entire life. She is still alive. So um, uh, in any case, let's see if she has been here. Uh, what year was that, 2014? That sounds about right. Yeah, now. so it was the last time that Jan was here. So, <laughs> and there he is when he was, when he was doing his uh, um, uh, pilot, pilot training. Uh, and then it was, like I said, it was supposed to be Joe Engel was the third member of their crew, but he gets pulled off because, uh, or he gets pulled off even though Gene, and this is Gene flying that helicopter. So doing those, these low level stuff, he crabbed, it was at the Banana River, um, which is there um, uh, uh, next to the Space Center um, in, uh, in Florida. So he just got too low to the water is essentially what happened. So in any case, in August of 1971, NASA has made the decision at this point in time, pulls Joe Engel off, um, uh, and yeah, needless to say, I talked to, I've talked to Joe about this one personally, so it was a big disappointment, um, but he understood why they did it. So, um, and being a military person, aye aye, and moved on. So in any case, uh, <laughs> that's the guy who'd been an X-15 pilot, does fly the shuttle eventually, command, et cetera, et cetera. In any case, though, so we have Gene Cernan, Ron Evans, and Jack Schmidt, who fly the mission. Jack Schmidt, New Mexico astronaut, <coughs> um, uh, uh, grows up over there in, uh, in west, uh, western New Mexico. Um, eventually, he goes to Caltech, where he gets his uh, bachelor's. He eventually goes on with a PhD and gets a PhD. He is working with NASA already on helping to train the astronauts um, when he does get selected as one of the, uh, as one of the uh, uh, scientist astronauts with NASA. Here he is out in the field doing some geology training. And after he gets selected here, we have a very, very young Jack Schmidt. And this is uh, um, during the Apollo 8 mission, in case you're curious. Remember that whole prime and backup? Okay, backup for Apollo 8 was Apollo 11 crew. Okay, here's the Apollo 11 crew. Um, and then Jack was just in there as well. And actually, I should say Apollo 11 crew right here. So, <clears throat> the uh, Apollo 17 mission, um, uh, and here I'm going to kind of get into a lot of the pre mission uh, training um, news conference. This was when they were um, displaying the, uh, the logo for the first time, which looks like this. This was the logo for the mission. Obviously, Apollo 17, NASA used the Roman numerals. Cernan, Evans, Schmidt, the three stars for the three astronauts. The eagle, representing the United States of America. The stripes, also representative of the flag. Um, you have the, the, the moon up here, the eagle partially over it, showing that we have now got a presence, and we have had a presence on the surface of the moon. You have um, the Apollo statue. Um, uh, in relief, looking off towards the future. Literally, this is how they describe it. You know, so looking off towards the future, where we are going to be exploring other bodies like Saturn and the rest of the galaxy. Um, uh, and, the, and and then the, the golden colors that you see in here are representative of the fact that this is the golden age of space exploration. So there you go. There's the Apollo 17 logo. Um, so the location that was chosen for Apollo 17 right here, and this is, this, this is a great, there's a great debate about where it's going to land. And so they're, they're taking a look at a number of locations, Copernicus Crater, the Mar Ibrium, um, the Ibrium Basin up here. So the Tycho Highlands, Silkovsky Crater, which is on the far side of the moon, not the dark side, the far side of the moon. There is no dark side. Uh, well, there actually, there is a dark side. Um, to the moon, but it's just the same as the Earth. Um, in any case, Mare Crisium, um, which uh, all of these were eliminated. Copernicus, because the material that they would have gotten from the Copernicus, Copernicus crater was similar to material that they'd already gotten on Apollo 12. Don't need to go back there. The Mar Ibrium, same thing. They'd already seen enough material from Apollo 15, so they don't need to go there. The Tycho Highlands, they eliminated that because it was too rough, um, the, the landing sites. Sokoski crater, far side. I'll get to that one in a second. The Marcrisium, well, the Soviets had already uh, landed in that region, and we're going to be going back there again, so they just said, we don't need to do that again. So the final three that it came down to were the Alphonsus Crater, the Gassendi Crater, and then the taurus Litro Valley. The Alphonsus Crater was eliminated in comparison to where they did pick to land, the taurus Litro Valley. Okay, spoiler. 
Um, uh, in any case, though, because it had, they figured it had less scientific value than what they could find at the Taurus Littrow Valley. So even though they were similar, they thought that there was better sites and better scientific knowledge to be gained at the Taurus Littrow Valley. The Gassendi Crater, um, the, uh, 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 the, the terrain around there, they figured out was a little bit too difficult. Um, for them to, uh, uh, to do the landing for. So, in any case, though, the final choice that ends up being is Taurus Littrow. Now, Jack Schmidt continued to argue as this process went on for the, for the Sokoski Crater on the far side. We hadn't been to the far side of the moon. The Sokoski Crater was going to have a lot of, I mean, they're going to get a lot more scientific knowledge from going to the far side of the moon than what they got on the near side um, already and what they'd seen. So, as a geologist, he argued it quite significantly, and a number of the scientists and some of the people within NASA were arguing it as well, but cost considerations. To go to the far side, you need to have and put satellites up around the moon so that you could have constant communication back to Earth, just to add that cost. And you can already, you know, once again, we were already canceling missions like crazy. And in fact, actually, the reason that Apollo 17 flies in December is because Nixon wanted to cancel it because he didn't want anything negative to happen like Apollo 13 in lead up towards an election. So NASA moved it to after the election. So, in any case though, yeah, politics always drives everything. So, in any case though, um, but Sokovsky, for the cost reasons, was, was eventually uh, eliminated. And so in February 1972, they decided to go to the Taurus Littrow Valley here, right next to this basin, um, the highlands right around there. And when we see the pictures, you'll see what we're talking about when we say the highlands. Okay, so there's going to be the landing site, which is going to be right here, and then they've already planned out, these are craters, in case you're curious, these strange looking things. You know, where they're going to be going, here's the base of the, the, the Lincoln Scarp. Um, you've got um, the North Massif and then the South Massif is down here, down here in this area. And you'll see that. So the rest of the pictures that you'll always see of this are actually turned like this, just to make it easier to, uh, um, to understand. Here's it in relief. You can see the Scarp there and then the Massif down here and the one up here. Okay, so here's our crew after the... Uh, the, the uh, um, the Saturn V rocket has made it out to the launch pad. They're in their spacesuits. Another shot. I'm just going to slip through some of this. So pre-mission, they have to do a lot of stuff, and I'm going to get into all the training. Not only are they doing press conferences, they're doing flights. Here he is putting the, the mission patch onto the aircraft for the, uh, for the first time. Jack Schmidt, also a pilot. Um, he has to get trained by the Air Force. Um, once the rocket um, gets out to the pad, they're going to be out there doing inspections while they're on the pad and while they're doing the training. This is them at the bottom. I love the chin straps. So. Um, they're going to be doing flight training in preparation for learning to land. Remember, Neil Armstrong almost got killed by this flying bedstead, um, the lunar landing training vehicle. This is Gene Cernan flying it um, uh, uh, there down um, near the Kennedy Space Center. There he is inside the LLTV. And if you want to see one of these, one of these is on display at the, uh, um, out in California, at the NASA Center out there in California. There he is after the, uh, after the flight. You're going to be inside the trainers. So, you know, not necessarily always wearing a spacesuit as you go through checklists, et cetera. So, I love the 1970s sports shirts. <coughs> big colors, big colors. So, um, training, uh, press conferences. This is Jack Schmidt doing a press conference on the area where they're going to be landing. And you can see here kind of North Massive landing spot. It's down here below. Um, quote from Jack Schmidt this time, because I always throw quotes in. When you think about it, the lunar missions were geology oriented. No, what a surprise. So, so you're going to do a lot of geology training. Here you are in Flagstaff, Arizona. This is a simulator for the cockpit. Kind of going in and out down the ladder with your coats on and your <laughs> check pants. I love the orange jacket and the check pants, so, and the yellow cap, so. In any case, though, more here at Flagstaff, walking around, you know, with some simulated equipment, but you're really kind of learning how to do geology, look around. This is Charlie Duke, who was on the backup crew, walking behind him. There they are. This is actually an explosive crater, explosion crater, so, that was, that was created there, and they're doing geology um, uh, testing around that. Here they are in the Grover, that's what it was called, it was the Ground Rover. So um, that could be used here on Earth. This was built um, by the uh, USGS 
uh, the Geological um, Society, and utilized when they were out doing training. Um, this was on display at the museum for a period of time um, back after it first opened up. More training. Working on checklists. I show this one to you because one of the things that you can look at afterwards, but you cannot touch. <laughs> this is one of the artifacts in the collection. This is one of those checklists. In fact, it's actually this one right here um, uh, that was flown in the command and service module um, uh, during the mission. And you can actually see some of their annotations. I'll leave it open up to this page. This was the GNC, the guidance and control checklist, what they used to navigate uh, on their way to and from the moon. So that will be sitting right here. Like I said, oops, take those off. Please don't touch. <laughs> but um, uh, then they're going to be doing, um, here they're working on stowage um, for the mission, stowing their, their lockers. One of the other things that you can see right over here, you'll notice they're not very nice, you know, clean room suits here with the Apollo 17 crew. So, and then here's one of those um, uh, clean suits over here as well. Um, training. Um, for after you land in the water and you're getting out after the mission. So they were doing this in one of the tanks there near Johnson Space Center. And you always have to train if the uh, spacecraft lands upside down as well. So how to get out then? <laughs> you can say it's not, you can see it's not easy. Okay, um, uh, and more geology training. Once again, they're geology based. So, and in this situation, they're training out at the rock pile out near the NASA Johnson Space, well, then called the Manned Spacecraft Center, now called the Johnson Space Center. In any case, though, that rock pile is still there. They're using it to train for the Mars missions now. So, in fact, they put a big slope on it, and they train with the, 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 new, the new Mars rover on it, et cetera, et cetera. In any case, though, and it, actually, if you're on the backside of Johnson Space Center, and you're driving on the road on the backside, you can see the rock pile. It's just on the other side of the fence. So, and you can see them sometimes training in there. Like I said, doing doing geology in their in their suits, getting used to it. You can see the buildings in the background, the roads over on this side. So heading out back out into the field again, um, going out to uh, um, uh, places all over. Whether it, you know they were, they were in Hawaii, Montana, Ontario, Canada, Arizona, New Mexico, Nevada, <laughs> California. You know, so um, all over the place training for the mission in different sites that had similarities. So obviously, this is a large um, uh, crater. Um, they used volcanic craters. They used meteor craters. They used explosive craters. When they went to Nevada, they actually used craters that had formed after the nuclear tests were done underground. Um, uh, and so, yeah, at, at all these locations doing, doing their geology training. Suit tests. Uh, underwater, um, uh, using the large, um, uh, the, the water facility, um, where they could actually simulate zero gravity as much as possible. Um, same thing that we utilize nowadays, it's a much bigger tank. Um, nowadays, but this is the simulator for the outside of the command and service module. This would be the sim bay. And there's Ron Evans training for retrieving the film canisters. Get up into the vomit comet, the KC-135 that would go up and down. They could simulate one-sixth gravity. They could simulate zero gravity as well. So um, here's Gene Center working on a, a rover that they put into the capsule. There's Jack Schmidt working with some of the science experiments equipment. So training, um, you got Ron Evans here training with Farouk El Baz on doing lunar geology from the command and service module orbiting around the, the, uh, the moon. More geology training. You'll notice I just keep going back to geology training. So um, deploying the lunar module off of the, uh, uh, excuse me, deploying the lunar rover off of the lunar module because it was all folded up and attached to the side of the, lun of the lunar module when it landed. You gotta clean your boots before you get back into the spacecraft. They just deployed it and we're getting onto it. So testing, training, driving it around on the rock pile, driving the Grover around, more geology training. They did a lot of geology training. I'm just showing you some of the different locations. <coughs> Once again, here working on uh, uh, working on more stowage back into the into the clean room. Spacesuit here. 
So working with the prime, this is the prime crew, the backup crew, and the support crew. The support crew were the folks who took care of all of the behind the scenes stuff, whether that was arrangements for the families, administrative duties, checklists, etc. And then the backup crew did all the training exactly the same as the prime crew, just not quite as much. So I love the fake mustaches too. <laughs> so, all except for Stu Rusa, who had his own natural. So. This is how the lunar rover, you know, so this is the actual real equipment getting ready to get loaded on the <coughs> spacecraft now. So now you're going to start seeing some of the real things going on board. So in May of 1972, the first stage um, uh, arrives at the vehicle assembly building here, gets put up to, gets put in the vertical position. The second stage comes in and gets put on May, May 18th, 1972, second stage getting ready to get put onto the first stage there. Here's the command and service module right here, the lunar module getting put into the enclosures um, uh, for that, which you see right here. There's the command and service module inside the vehicle assembly building, and the lunar module is inside here. And they will be stacking it up on top of that. This is another rocket for another mission. <coughs> so here it is, the third stage getting stacked on top of the second stage. And here's the fully assembled Saturn V rocket as they roll it out on August 28, 1972. So and you can see a very large crowd out here, which when we go to the next slide, you'll see that crowd up here. So, and it rolls out at a whopping one mile an hour, all the way traveling out, you know, for almost four hours, out to the actual launch pad. Um, the, the control panel for the crawler transporter, um, one of those is on display up on the third floor in the museum, and you'll see that it goes to zero to two miles an hour both directions. So it could go almost two miles an hour with nothing on it. So rolling out from the vehicle assembly building a little further. Here we have the astronauts down at the bottom just to give you a little bit of scale of that beast right there. Those are people right there. Anybody know what the nicknames of the two crawler transporters are nowadays? Hans and Franz. From the old nineteen er, from the old comedy routine. So in any case, though, um, this is just a great shot. So this is the countdown demonstration test, um, the day that they did that. They end up doing a ton of tests with the astronauts in the spacecraft and with not with the astronauts in the spacecraft out on the launch pad as well. This was one of the ones that they did with the astronauts actually in the spacecraft. But it's just a great shot of the, of the rocket on the pad at night. Now, pre-launch day, or launch day. So here we have the astronauts um, uh, getting ready, having breakfast um, with the backup crew, NASA officials, etc. Getting suited up, um, uh, Jack Schmidt, Ron Evans, Gene Cernan right here, and then the other crew members coming out of the, uh, the building right there. Getting into the transfer van and heading out to the launch pad. Okay, Gene Cernan quote from the countdown reached 10 seconds and I could almost hear an invisible crescendo of stirring background music. Anchors away. <laughs> Five, four, three, two, one, and we had ignition. You notice there's a slight navy bent to all of this. So, um, with especially with Ron Evans and Gene Cernan, and Gene Cernan um, being navy pilots. So, <clears throat> and we have on December seventh, nineteen seventy-two, at thirty-three minutes after midnight, we have ignition and launch of Apollo seventeen. Night launch, uh, and absolutely beautiful. From the description of everybody who was there, I was not. Needless to say. So, uh, in any case, though, and you can see it here lighting up the sky. That was the only night launch. That was the only night launch of the uh, of the Apollo program. Yep. It was impressive. I remember. <laughs> Were you there? I was in Orlando. Orlando. Oh yeah. I'm, yeah. yeah. Hmm? Trust me. Yeah. You can see SpaceX rockets. Yeah. It's a bit, it's very funny to be at Disney. This happened to me. To be at Disney World and for there to be a launch. And I kind of keep up with launches, needless to say. So I knew that there was a launch, and I was I positioned my family while we were there, so that we were looking in the right direction. And yes, you could see the SpaceX Falcon 9 lifting off and coming up, and see the people just stopping, going, "What's that?" You know? And, you know? Yeah, it's like it's a SpaceX rocket. So in any case, though, and here it is heading off that evening. Okay, so um, a couple hours after launch, they are on their way to the moon, and the uh, this is the lunar module, the very top of it. And they are coming in to um, dock with the lunar module. Anybody? Are these stars? Yes or no? Who says yes? Who says no? Just about everybody. What is it? Debris. 
It's debris. Yeah. It's debris from the undocking, etc. It still continues to follow you as you're on your way to the moon. In fact, actually, the astronauts sometimes have problems with the debris and sighting stars for navigation. In any case, they're coming into dock, connect to the lunar module, pull it out of the second or out of that upper stage. And there is after they have pulled it, pulled out the, the or the excuse me, the second stage going away as well. Not the upper stage, but the second stage. Okay, this picture was taken on the way the, the, to, the, to the moon. It is probably one of the most famous pictures of the Earth, probably besides Earthrise, which was taken during the Apollo 8 mission. This is called the Blue Marble. It gets used all the time um, uh, during uh, presentations, etc. Um, what, I mean, obviously we're looking at the Earth. What are we looking at, though? Africa, yeah. This is the way the picture, this is the view that they actually had of the Earth at the time. The way that you normally see it is like this. So they just flipped the image 180 degrees, but the astronauts, when they were looking back at the Earth, it was actually like that. So in any case, and this is the only picture that really, that they ever got really showing uh, the Antarctic. So. Okie doke. And then eventually, um, uh, on December 10th, they get into lunar orbit where they're going to be staying for a number of days from the 10th through the 17th. This is one of the Earth rises um, during the time that they were in lunar orbit. So there's Gene, there's Ron. If you're at zero G, you can take pictures where one person's right side up and one person's upside down. So they eventually undock. So landing day, they undock, they inspect each other's spacecraft for about an hour and a half um, and do all the pre-checks for landing. Um, uh, before the, the lunar module does a descent burn and starts to head down towards lower orbit and then eventually we'll do another burn to, uh, to start the landing process. This picture I love because right there is the command and service module flying above the lunar surface and actually you're looking down towards where they're going to be landing. So they're going to be landing in the valley. So in any case, curiosity is the essence of human existence. Who are we? Where are we? Where do we come from? Where are we going? I don't know. I don't have any answers to those questions. I don't know what's over there around the corner, but I want to find out. <laughs> so they do land at 6.54 on December 11th. This is Eastern time. I'm using that. So, and they get ready to do, or excuse me, they land before that. And then after a couple hours, they do the first EVA. Sorry about that. So 6.54 is when they start the first EVA. Um, and this EVA is going to last for 7 hours and 12 minutes. Some of these pictures, especially the ones that just show the, the astronauts on the surface or whatever, so aren't necessarily, aren't necessarily associated, associated with EVA 1, 2, or 3. Um, but a lot of the geology pictures are associated with the moments during those EVAs. Because there's some that are just... They're just artistic, and I wanted to throw them in wherever. So this one is not, yeah, so it's during a later EVA. Remember that, that plan that they had. This was where the lunar module was located. So the first EVA was going to be mostly walking around here, testing the lunar module, driving it around, making sure it works after you've got it deployed, setting up the Apollo lunar surface experiment package, the, the, another experiment package that they had here, and then doing a, EV, and then doing a drive out to Steno Crater here, um, they were supposed to go out to Emory. That had to be canceled because they had problems setting up the ALSA. And they also had a little issue with the rover. And I'll explain that here in a bit. That was going to be EVA 1. So I won't get into the other two. We'll see this picture again. By the way, the solid red line is the going out. The dotted red line is the coming back <laughs> to the lunar module. Here is the lunar rover early on in the mission. You'll also see that picture up over there on the wall. We have a number of pictures here from Apollo 17. Well, actually, another one here from 16, but that's another story. Gene Cernan is driving it. You can tell that he's got the red striping on his suit right there and right there. That's so that they could tell the difference between the two, because they knew that during Apollo 11 and 12, couldn't tell the difference between the two astronauts. It looked exactly the same. So they started putting stripes on the helmet of the commander during Apollo um, 13. And you can tell that this is very early on in the mission, because he's clean. He's really clean. And you'll see how that devolves over time. Okay, another picture taken early on. Gene Cernan saluting the flag after they had just deployed it. Gene Cernan again. This wasn't during EVA 1. Like I said, I put stuff in. So, okay, the, the, the ALSEP. Um, you had a central station, thermal generator here, um, RTG, nuclear, um, uh, radionuclide thermal, thermal generator. D 
develops power just due to a heat difference. Um, uh, seismometers, magnetometers, heat flow experiment, super there was a number of experiments and I can go into all of those um, uh, uh, if you desire at some point in time. Um, separate from this, you can also look it up online. The, the, the 17 had the largest surface experiment package of any of the missions, needless to say. And here it is all, all set up out here, so on the lunar surface. I love the lunar module here is in the background. Gravimeter, so where they were measuring the, the local, the, the uh, 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 um, gravity shifts, excuse me, trying to determine whether or not Einstein's theory of relativity was actually correct. So, in any case, looking back from the lunar module back towards um, uh, the ALSEP station, here's while they were in, the, like I said, during that first EVA. And when I remember I said highlands, okay, now you get an idea of, you know, the valley amongst the highlands. Okay, so during the first EVA, Gene Cernan at one point in time is walking along um, early on uh, in the EVA and on his left, on, he's coming around and on the right hand side of the back of the lunar module, there's the big pocket that's on his spacesuit right here. He's got a hammer on it. He catches the right rear fender of the lunar rover. The rover's right here. So, and you see the fenders, you know, in this, in this picture right here. Mm -hmm. So this right rear fender, like I said, this was early on, so you don't see any change in this fender, and actually it was on the back side. And there's segments to this. You see there's, there's multiple segments. There's one, two, there's a third segment on the back. That third segment on the back gets popped off. They had a problem with something like this happen on 16, but it didn't completely pop off, so they were able to fix it with, guess what? Duct tape. Okay? So 17, though, boom, completely comes off. And so now... They're trying to figure out how to fix this, so they try to take duct tape and create a pseudo fender out there with duct tape, but it doesn't hold because of the lunar dust, and as they're driving, it knocks it off. It's kicking up a rooster tail of lunar dirt, and it's, if you know anything about the lunar dirt, it's different than earth dirt. Earth dirt has been um, uh, rounded by wind, by water, and things like that. Lunar dirt is... Arr! Okay. It's very ragged, and it grips to everything. So, in any case, though, so it was getting rooster tailed up and thrown all over everything, and they knew, okay, this is bad. <coughs> Couldn't do anything about it on EVA one. Tried the duct tape wouldn't hold, um, but um, they knew that they had time to try and fix it between one and two. So EVA number two comes up, and yes, the folks back on Earth come up with a solution, where they take apart map maps. The lunar maps, which are quite hard, think about uh, you know like hard paper, um, cardstock type thing, but thicker, okay? And it's also coated, and so they take the cardstock, and yes, they do use duct tape. But when you duct tape it inside the spacecraft, you can seal up everything nice and tight. You can bend it over, and then you can bring clamps with you out here. And these were the clamps that they used to hold lights and cameras inside um, the actual spacecraft. Uh, in any case, though, and that's what they utilized um, for to, to do the repair. And I'll show some pictures of, the, uh, of this here in a moment. So they go out, and that's the first thing they do during EVA number two, is put together a temporary fender. And guess what? It does hold just fine through EVA two and EVA three. And then they eventually bring it back to Earth. It's on display at the National Air and Space Museum um, in Washington, D.C. You can go and see that on display there. The American Body Association, or the, the Auto Body Association of America, after this EVA, after they finish up all their EVAs, gives them lifetime memberships in their association. <laughs> I love that. So, in any case, though, EVA 2, um, in this situation, going to the south, so it's to come all the way down here, almost five miles around, down to Nansen Crater, and then come back, stopping off at Shorty Crater, which was one of the ones that NASA really wanted to get to, and you'll see why in a moment, because it actually did turn out to be as, uh, um, uh, as uh, valuable as they thought it would be. This was the repair, and this is the action. You can see there's the maps. You know, so, and then they duct taped them together in this format where they had bent them over, and then they clamped them to the wheel. So, and the, you, yeah, I can just see the edge of the repair back there. Also, look at how much dirtier. 
dirtier they are right here. So, and this is not Gene Cernan. Gene Cernan sits in the left-hand driver's seat. This is Jack Schmidt. So. Okay, one of the things that they did at this point in time is an actual core sample. Um, they took multiple core samples, but th during EVA2, one of the core samples they took is this one right here. Why does that one matter? You'll hear that at the end of the lecture. This one comes back into play in the last couple of years. Okay, so they get they they, they head out to Nansen Crater. Um, they're doing science at multiple stations. The first one is Nansen Crater, which, like I said, is almost five miles away. It's the furthest that any of the Apollo crews get away from the actual lunar module. Um, it's at the end of what they call their walking distance. They don't go any further than that because if the lunar rover breaks down, they have to be able to walk back to the lunar module, and that's the extent of their walk back distance. So. In any case, though, this is Shorty Crater right here, okay, and this, you know, right here, so you see Jack. Gene Cernan has moved his way around the crater. He's taking a panoramic picture. This picture is actually much bigger, so um, uh, we don't have the, the whole extent of it um, right here, but this picture is much wider, the entire panorama. Um, this is just zoomed in a bit just to show you this little section right here which is this bit right here. This is a gnomon, by the way, one of those is on display up on the fifth floor of the museum. It's used for color correction and to show which direction is straight up and down um, uh, when they're taking pictures. And this is where Jack Schmidt had trenched in and dug up what they found right here, which you see is slightly discolored. It's not that gray of the lunar surface. It's orange. Because they thought that Sh Shorty, Cri Shorty Crater might not be a crater at all, but might have been a fumarole. So, in any case, the vol essentially a volcano vent. Um, and so they were looking for new, G new, what they call new, which would have been less than, quote unquote, three and a half, three billion years old, um, uh, volcanic activity. That was one of the reasons that they wanted to go to Taurus Litro Valley. And this crater was one of the specific locations <coughs> that they thought um, might be indication of, of new. And when they found this, um, what looked like orange volcanic soil, needless to say, Gene Cernan and, and Jack Schmidt kind of went crazy, and the folks in the geological back room went kind of crazy, and they thought they'd found exactly what they were looking for. They got it back and found out that it wasn't what they thought it was. Yes, it was from a volcano, but it was an ancient volcano. It had been deposited, covered, and then a, crate, then a meteor had come in and knocked the stuff out. So. Huh. But it still was important. This is actually Shorty Crater, in case you're curious, and as we zoom in a bit, these are, you know, this is a picture taken back during the Apollo era. This is with the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. Orbiter. There's the rock, and right here is where Jack Schmidt dug in, and you can see the footprints along through here. That's where Gene Cernan was standing. There's where the rover was parked, and here's where Jack Schmidt was digging. And you can actually see where, where they walked while they were there. Picture of Jack Schmidt during, taken during the EVA, looking back at the Earth. We have that picture on display up over there as well. I can tell it's Jack because there's no red stripe up there. And not during EVA too. How can I tell that? He's clean. <laughs> so, yep. Yep. So in any case though, EVA number three on December 13th. So three EVAs, the most time spent on the lunar surface, the most spent time spent out of a spacecraft, the longest amount of EVA time on the lunar surface. Apollo 17, you know, we, were, we had gotten more experience at this point in time. Seven hours and 15 minutes for this EVA. And this one is going to go north, so they're going to drive up along here, get up to the sculptured hills, and then come back um, and come to the lunar, back to the lunar module. One of the places that they stop off is Split Rock, which actually was renamed to Tracy's Rock. Said that there was going to be a name. You can see it's a Split Rock. This is a rock that actually had rolled down the mountainside and then broken apart down at the bottom. And so they were taking samples around it. This is Jack Schmidt. Um, uh, come walking back around it. There's a lunar module over there. Slightly closer picture here. You can see Jack Schmidt is carrying the gnomon, putting it in another, another location. They'd taken a sample from right here. You can see. Here he is on the other side, just to give you an idea of the size of that rock. It's almost like a house, you know, as, as big as it is. <coughs> and here he, is, here he is doing a little bit more work. There's that gnomon once again. <laughs> Notice, not quite as clean. So, Love this picture, this was during the drive back. Okay, that's the lunar module right there. Now, the lunar module is not on a slope, that was just the way that he, they took the picture, the, the way that the camera, the slope that they were on. 
because here you can see that they're obviously not on a slope. Eventually, as they get back, um, they do pick up one more sample. During the first EVA, Jack had seen a rock that he said, that doesn't look like it should be here. Okay, it was this kind of finely grained black, dark gray black rock that was out in the middle of this field of very light gray. And he said, that doesn't look right. And so he said, we need to pick that up when we're coming back from the, the 30 VA. Besides which, it was a very big rock. It was the, one of the biggest rocks that was, uh, was collected. And so they knew they needed to pick it up and put it in the lunar module, not try and carry it back um, to, the, uh, to the actual uh, lunar module that they needed to put in lunar rover. So as they're on their way back, as they're approaching the rock and in the discussion that they're having, you can hear Jack saying, there, you know, there it is, essentially. <clears throat> they, uh, they get over and um, Gene Cernan pulls right up next to it. Jack gets out, goes, down, goes to try and pick it up and actually kicks the rock. Oh. Knocks it under the lunar rover, has to get down and get, you know, and it's not easy to do in these spacesuits, you know, to bend down, try and get it out from under there. Gene says, you know, you know, are you going to do some work down there? And he's like, oh, you want me to check the oil while I'm under here? You know, it's just <laughs> kind of those typical discussions. They have a lot of fun. If you, there's a video that we play up on the fifth floor where you can hear them singing together, you know, while strolling on the moon one day in the merry, merry month of May. No, not May, December. Did it, you know, just, they, were, they had a lot of fun. So um, while they were up there, while they were doing all this work. In any case, though, Jack gets it, puts it into there, um, and then Gene eventually, they take it back, they unload everything into the lunar module, and then Gene drives the lunar rover back out, parks it, and then walks back to the lunar um, module. This is the lunar rover parked in its final position, far enough away. Um, <clears throat> and interestingly enough, remember that back section that was turned off? It's not here anymore. Once again, that's on display at the National Air and Space Museum, that, uh, um, that temporary fender that they put on. Gene then came across, oh. you can see the fender's missing on this side too. He popped this one off. That's on display at the museum I used to be at, the Kansas Cosmosphere and Space Center. So in any case though, um, uh, they managed to get a hold of it from NASA. I wish I had it. Yeah. Um, uh, in any case though, here. This is the rock that Jack picked up. Why does this rock matter? for multiple reasons. The biggest one being, for us, the piece of the rock that's on display in our museum is a part of this. Three sections were taken off of it. One of them went to the Smithsonian, one of them went to NASA headquarters, one of them came to us. So, and that's specifically because of the connection with Jack Schmidt and New Mexico. And so that is the, on the third floor of the museum, the piece of rock that is on display is a large chunk of this rock right here, 70215, which was the one that Jack picked up um, uh, during that, when he, the, the one that he kicked. Under the, under the rover. Other pieces have been cut off of it as well, one of which is what NASA uses as the touch the moon, right here. So, in any case though, um, the last things that they do on the lunar, lunar surface, they do pick up a rock that's in the area, and they talk about this being a friendship rock, a goodwill rock, and pieces of that are cut apart and given to countries all over the world. Similar to what was done with Apollo 11 and Apollo 17 now, fragments of that are given to every state in the Union, every country throughout the world, and then certain agencies um, uh, as well, like the Department of Defense and, and uh, NASA, you know, things like that, to put on display. New Mexico's is on display at the uh, Roswell Museum and Art Center, um, that thing. The Apollo 11 ones are actually in our collection and will be going on display up in the third floor uh, sometime over the next year. In any case, though, this is Jack's holding the rock right there as they're talking about um, that, that. Here it is, right there. These are all television camera uh, images, if you couldn't tell that, that are, that are recorded. This is the last picture of an astronaut, and probably the last picture um, of, uh, taken on the lunar surface, a uh, picture of Jack Schmidt um, before they got back into, uh, into the spacecraft. Here they are after they got back into the lunar module, looking very tired and very dirty. So, um, Gene Cernan, they have a plaque on the lunar module. Um, the, the last words that, uh, that are said uh, from the surface of the moon. I'm on the surface, and as I take man's last step from the surface, back home for some time to come, but we believe not too long into the future, I'd just like to say what I believe history will record. <laughs> that America's challenge of today has forged man's destiny of tomorrow, and as we leave the moon at Taurus-Littrow, 
Litro, excuse me, we leave as we came and, God willing, as we shall return with peace and hope for all mankind. Godspeed the crew of Apollo 17. So those were the last um, uh, uh, words spoken before he got back into the capsule for the broadcast. They lifted off at 554 on December 14th and docked two hours later with the uh, lunar module. But these are the pictures. Interestingly enough, um, the lunar module or the lunar rover camera, um, this was the only one that they actually were able to follow the, the ascent module as it took off. Ed Fendel, who was the, the, the flight controller, was in charge of the, moving the camera as they're walking around on the lunar surface, as they're driving, as they're doing everything. You know, he was the camera operator <coughs> for each of, the, uh, um, each of the moonwalks. Think about his job, though. He had to take into account, okay, when they say this, they're pushing this button, but that happened this amount of time ago. So I have to then predict exactly based on that when this spacecraft is actually going to fire the rockets, lift off, and how quickly it's going to go so that I pan up at the right speed. They hadn't been able to do it on 15 or 16, needless to say. 17, though, they got it right finally. So, and these are pictures as it starts to go up and oops and it starts to follow and he follows it up quite a ways so but there's uh, just before they're docking here and I love this shot because you can actually see Gene Cernan inside the the lunar module right there inside the ascent stage this is the recently taken lunar lunar reconnaissance lunar reconnaissance orbiter shots there's the descent stage the ex ALSEP experiment is out here um, and then you can see all their footsteps and you can see rover tracks as well, going in all these different directions. Inside the spacecraft, don't forget, we still had Ron Evans up there. What was he doing? He was doing experiments. So he made uh, 75 orbits, 147 hours, 43 minutes. There was this SIMBE right here, Scientific Instrument, Instruments uh, Instrumentation Module. So um, that had a whole bunch of different experiments in it as well, panoramic cameras, um, laser um, altimeters, uh, sonographic, so that they could try and get depth measurements on the uh, on the moon as well. A whole bunch of experiments. Just kind of, I love the art, artist artistic rendition of it. He did, like I said, lots of photography while he was up there. This is a neat picture because this is actually the lunar surface with Earth light being the only thing lighting it, not sunlight. That's light from the reflection of the Earth. So this is the sim bay um, uh, as they're you know kind of putting it together. Once again, I love the clean suits. So panoramic camera, um, the the foot restraints, laser altimeter, mapping camera, and there was film cassettes for these panoramic and, and uh, mapping cameras that had to be retrieved during an EVA that was done 184,000 miles from Earth. So it was the last Apollo EVA. Um, Ron Evans, not Gene Cernan, went out to do the EVA, even though the red stripe is on here. He just borrowed Gene's helmet, because he did not have a full-on helmet, because he was just inside the command module this entire time. They didn't want to send another helmet, they just had him use Gene's helmet for the, uh, um, for the actual EVA. And he retrieved those, these film canisters. You can see, almost lost one. Almost lost one. So, landing. 19 December at 2.25 Eastern Standard Time. Splashdown. Navy frogmen. Uh, Pararescue men, essentially so. Recovering the crew. Here they are coming out. You can see the helicopter in the background here. You can see them lifting off the crewmen in the basket. Carrier in the background. And then eventually the carrier. The, the helicopters don't lift the spacecraft out of the water. That's actually done with a crane from the ship. They just lifted the crew members out, as opposed to the Mercury time when the helicopter actually did lift the spacecraft out of the water. And celebration in mission control. Jerry Griffin, Gene Krantz. Don't forget to light the cigar for the guy who's on crutches. <laughs> Who is the spacecraft designer, by the way. So. And then land the crew on the helicopter, or on the carrier. Cut the cake. If you're doing a Navy celebration, you've got to have a cake. And you've got to cut it. So, eventually, this is when um, Gene and Jack came back and did a, uh, a thank you to the folks in Mission Control. This is actually done during the Skylab mission. So, th that's, you know, what's, what's going on right now is all the folks are there for Skylab, and Gene and Jack are in there doing a thank you um, for them. Um, the crew is fetid, uh, um Super Bowl number seven. 
Um, they're taken out there. They're they're driven all the way around the stadium before the uh, the actual game. This was the game when the Dolphins won and had the perfect season. In case you don't remember that. So go to the White House. Ron, Gene, Jack. So remember, I mentioned that sample that was taken on the second EVA. They sealed up a number of the samples for future years, knowing that technology might improve, equipment might improve, they might be able to learn more from the litter samples in the future. So a lot of the samples were sealed up, never, you know, not to be opened in future years. This is, that's, this is one of those core samples that was taken on EVA2 and it was opened up three years ago. So when they started doing geology research again in preparation for returning to the moon on the Artemis missions. And so here's, here's the original radiography that was done below, and this was done in 74. This is what they can do nowadays. So you can see the difference in what we can see, what we can learn about what's inside, you know. So, in any case, though, if you want to learn more, a few good books. So, um, uh, uh, Gene Cernan, Last Man on the Moon, A Long Voyage to the Moon, um, which was written about Ron Evans. It's the history of him. And then Return to the Moon by Harrison Schmidt, talking about his, his experiences and also future exploration of the moon as well. It might be helpful to realize that very probably the parents of the first native-born Martians are alive today. One more thing. <laughs> Army Navy game is coming up <laughs> this week. And yes, this is that flag. So, yeah, I, I was hoping that he'd be able to take it back up with him in March, but but yeah, no, he's got he's got a limit on what he can take. So he is taking stuff for uh, for the museum uh, as well. So. Uh, a number of commemorative items uh, up for the museum um, uh, on the mission that he's going on. Just don't walk around Fort Bliss with that, I don't think. It's <laughs> with this? Not right, no, not right at the moment. But the interesting thing is, is if you watch the Army-Navy game this year, Navy's uniforms actually commemorate the, the astronauts that have come from the Navy and from the Naval Academy. Because the Naval Academy actually has more astronauts than any other institution um, in the United States. Um, in any case, though, and more people that have walked on the moon, yada, yada, yada. Um, so their uniforms, you know, it says, like, from, from the seat of the stars on their helmets. It's got NASA emblems on it. You, yeah, it's all, you know, it's got uh, um, uh, the, yeah. So just keep an eye on that one. Okay, questions. I saw you had one. Why not Prow Morrow when oh. you were trying to decide on where to go? Because one of the, the one of the other missions has already gone to Frau Moro. I'm sorry. One of the other missions they plant they they changed Frau Moro was already supposed to be Apollo 13. Right. They sent um, uh, uh, 14 to Frau Moro. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm so sorry. it was it been there done that kind gotcha. of thing. So yeah, okay. already taken care of. Two questions. First one, you said they did testing in meteor craters. Did they do that one in no. by Winslow? No. And. That during the Apollo program, yes. Okay. So I, before 17, I don't remember reading anything about a, the Apollo 17 crew in preparation for their mission going to that one. Okay. And secondly, they used the map. Well, what did they use for a map if the map was a fender? What, <laughs> what map did they use? The, the, so. <laughs> You had you had mul you had you had multiples you had backups um, you had stuff that yeah so they took things that they weren't going to need anymore on the lunar surface and that's what they used so and some of it was map covers as well it was really the covers so what was significant about that black rock did they find out you know the one that rolled under the uh, the, the seven zero two one five yeah so, well, so it, what the uh, analysis what they find back then, so anything special that it was not, nothing crazy about it there was another rock that he picked up that they did that that was on trying to remember if it was eva two or three i think it was eva number three um there was a rock that he that jack schmidt did pick up on um eva number three uh and, and i'll get back to the to 70215 in a moment so that was and is considered um, possibly one of the two most significant rocks. Um, uh, um, the, uh, the Genesis rock from 15 is one of the most significant ones. And then one that they picked up on 16, which is the oldest rock that, um, that they found that, is actually, that was actually um, 
material that hadn't been um, uh, impacted, essentially, so um, or created by an impact. So that was kind. Of, that was an interesting find, and that one's still being used by scientists um, for research. And then seven zero two one five. Um, the, uh, it, the what they essentially found out with it is is that it had been ejected into that area, so oh it was an asteroid or it was something. flung into that area. It was no, it was a lunar rock. Oh, okay. It wasn't an asteroid. It was a lunar rock, but it had been flung into that area from another impact somewhere else. So, yeah, that rock, the seven zero two one five, yeah, they kicked under the yeah. The rock. Back on Earth, is that like we think of a rock? Uh, I, I mean, from the looks of it, I'd have a hard time picking it up. One six but, gravity. But yet he didn't stump his toe. He kicked the rock. Yeah, well, it didn't <laughs> kick it. You got to remember though, the suit is extremely heavy. The boots are extremely large, uh -huh. and it's cumbersome. And so, as he was getting off of the lunar rover and then turning around, he bumped it, and it just went under, so that he couldn't go straight down and get it. He actually had to go like this yeah. to get the rock back out and then put it up, you know, so don't think like it went this far under the lunar, you know, yeah. it literally just, if the lunar, because Gene had pulled up literally right alongside of it. Oh, okay. And so, you know, because they, they did a number of experiments along the way, separate from the rock, where Jack would sit there and say, this is a good spot. Jack led a lot of the geology on this mission. He, it's not that he was the, in command of the EVAs, but he was the one driving a lot of the decisions as far as what they're going to look at, do, collect, etc. Um, now Gene knew a ton of geology as well, but Jack was the true expert on it. So as they were driving, one of the things that, that Jack was um, assigned to do was to sit there and say, okay, this location here, and Gene would pull up to that location, stop there, they would take samples from that location. And literally it was like, pull up, Jack had a a, a, a scoop rake that he could just scoop it up. They could do the sample and put it in the in the collection um, bag. So there was a lot of that as well. But this was just they noticed that rock off the bat. They pulled up right next to it, and as he was getting out to get it, he bumped it and it moved just under. So he couldn't just bend down and get it. He actually had to reach under the lunar rover. So, yes. so what what would be the amount of weight that they could bring back in samples? They brought back 250, almost 250 pounds of samples. Oh. So yeah, quite a, quite a bit between the rocks and the soil. Okay. So yeah. like on one EVA, they brought back 75 pounds. They brought back, you know, it was it was a lot for each EVA. And some of it was scoops of dirt. Um, some of it was just rocks that they you know picked up, large and small. So oh yeah, I get back. Was Gene Shoemaker ever assigned to a mission? Gene Shoemaker. Two hours. Yeah, a medical problem. I'm trying to th I'm trying to think if not during the Apollo program and not during the you know during the the, the, the follow on Skylab. I was trying to think if you ever got assigned to a shuttle mission. Honestly, I don't remember. I'll, I'll have to take that one as a lookup. I don't remember. Uh, yeah, sir. The dirty space suits. Yes. Well, how when they got back onto. The, the, the spaceship. I mean, what did they do with the dirty spaceship? I mean, you say that dust was different from dust that clean. Dust. Yeah. So and, and so, so how so, did they so, not contaminate the instruments and stuff? Yes, it did. So yes, there was dust inside the Apollo spacecraft. There is to this day. Um, uh, Jack Schmidt's spacesuit is still is considered to this day. Um, it's it's in storage at the National Air and Space Museum. Um, I've held one of the boots from that spacesuit inside the, the, the morgue, is what they generally call it, because they're all refrigerated. Yes. Um, they're in a refrigerator, essentially, so, um, to try and slow down the process of deterioration, because the suits are deteriorating, and they can't stop it. Um, uh, in any case, though, <coughs> um, and they're filthy. Hmm. In fact, actually, if you have white gloves on, and you hold the lunar boot, those gloves are no longer white. And I did ask if I could take them with me, <laughs> which I was not allowed to. Um, uh, in, in any case, though, um, but Jack Schmitz is considered the most pristine, um, preserved of the suits because no cleaning was done to it whatsoever. Every other one was in some way, shape, or form by NASA or by um, Air and Space Museum cleaned. Um, and so, you know, with getting as much dust off of it as possible, etc., they left Jack's just as it was. Um, coming off the lunar surface, but yes, it did. The stuff did go airborne, um, but 
you're not talking about enough to really degrade the uh, um, the uh, uh, the equipment um, in the uh, uh, inside the command module uh, or inside the lunar module. So, in, did it get in their lungs too? Yeah. So, but. Uh, you know, on that picture you showed the equipment that's, that laid out? Yes, the all, all set package and the set package, etc. How do they get that equipment there, number one? And it looked like they're all connected with cables. That's, yes. You know, yeah. that's a lot of uh, a lot of physically large. Yes. And they, can, and they could connect the cables while they were there. The package of all the different items um, was carried on the side of the lunar module. And so then they folded down, just like they did with the lunar module, where they folded down the lunar module and then opened it up. They had, and this was true going all the way back to Apollo 11, there was a side of the spacecraft and they had, they had cables, you know, essentially that they could release the lever here and then the cable would come down, they'd pull the cable and it would lower a section of the spacecraft. Yeah. Literally. That's the army calling, they don't like your photo. <laughs> literally, literally, that's that meeting, you know, so in any, in any case, though, I told him I was going to be late, you know, so. Um, the, uh, the, with the all-set package, the cabling going out, the experience, the, one side of the, the, the one quadrant of the lunar module could lower down the side, and all of the tools, all of the experiments, etc., um, were all located there, and they just unstrapped things, took them out to the location. You'll see on missions, you'll see maybe one of the astronauts carrying this bar that's got things on the end of it. You know, those are experiments that they're carrying out there, and then they set it down, and they detach this section here. They unravel the cables, they attach everything, trying to keep as much dust off of it as possible, which was some of the joke, you know, where the science, you know, scientists would be saying, well, try and make sure that you don't get as dust onto it, and the astronauts are just like, <laughs> yeah, right, you know, so, um, but yeah, I mean, and there was a ton of thing on there. Um, lunar seismic profiling experiment, surface gravitometer, the atmospheric composition experiment, ejecta meteorite experiment, heat flow experiment. They're trying to measure how much heat was still coming out of the lunar surface. Um, yeah, I mean, it was just just crazy the amount of you know items, and that was just in the all set, just just those experiments, let alone the SEP and, and things that they that they set up elsewhere. Are they still running? They ran <coughs> the all set package from Apollo 17. Um, they kept it running up until September 1977, and then it was shut down, I think it was September 30th of 1977, they finally shut down the experiments that were still operating, because that RTG will go for quite a while, you know, so, yeah, it's essentially, it's a, it's a radioactive isotope that's decaying, giving off heat, and as it gives off heat, then there's fins on the outside of it, and you get a heat differential between the, the isotope decaying in the interior and the exterior cold, and when you have a heat differential like that, you can generate electricity. Oh. So, yeah. Thermoelectric. Yeah, thermoelectric generation. Yeah, so it's great. We use them on spacecraft as well. So it can stuff last a lot longer than, uh, than um, uh, solar arrays. Yeah, so. Yeah, your spacecrafts are still going after decades. <laughs> yep, yep, with some of the, yeah, with the RTG. Yep, so. Any other questions? Oh, I just had one. The rocks that we brought back weighed about half of what the rover weighed. Did we need to drop weight on the way back? The, or, did, well, you, the, or did they mean to? They weigh they weigh a lot less than what the rover. A lot less than what the rover. Right. Weighed. A like lot less. And coming miles. back, you were only coming back with the ascent stage. So you know you you were dropping off the massive portion of your spacecraft below and just coming back with the upper portion. If you go into the museum, you'll actually see we do have you know we have a an engine for the uh, for the command module. We also have one of the descent engines, um, and we have one of the um, engines for, for lifting off the lunar surface on display in the museum. So you can kind of size compare all of those. But no, it was, you know, they, they, they did have a limit on what they could bring back, but even then, um, they, were, they were able to scavenge the spacecraft and take a lot of stuff off of the spacecraft as well, which was a, which was a military tradition going back for forever that when you decommissioned a ship, when you decommissioned an aircraft or anything like that, people just, you know, because it was going to get torn apart anyways and just destroyed. And so going back, you know, World War II and before, the, the service members just <laughs> grabbed whatever they could off of it. The Apollo astronauts were no different. They grabbed hand controllers and 
And you know, whatever whatever they could grab a hold of, you know, to take back with them, they did as souvenirs. <coughs> so. Okie okay, doke, thank you very much. Kathy, do you have anything to put out? I do have things to put out. Stuff to talk about. You know me. That's a silly question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fifth floor, we have the Apollo 17 movie. There you go. Um, so next Thursday, we do have an Astronomy League meeting at uh, 7 o'clock in the front classroom at the theater. <coughs> Then on the 17th, we have the brand new Space Tradition Holiday on the Hill. This is going to be a free day uh, for everybody. Lots of kids, crafts, and activities right here on this floor. There'll be clouds in a bottle and Christmas catapults, my personal favorite, uh, and, and several other things the kids will be doing. We have a couple of uh, ladies who volunteer to sing carols for us. We have a food drive in the theater. Two cans of food get you a live planetarium show, or uh, uh, rather a live star show, or one of our planetarium films. So tell everybody you know, bring the whole family and come up. It's a free day all day long, and uh, there's gonna be a lot of fun and activities. Our January launch pad lecture, we have not settled on yet, so it'll be kind of a surprise. Um, to us, we, too. It, true. <laughs> uh, we have a, a new educator who we had scheduled. Turns out he's got it proposed to his soon-to-be wife on that day, and so we thought maybe it'd be in our best interest to go ahead and let him do that. <laughs> so um, be sure, if you've got a place where you can hang one of these posters, I would sorely uh, uh, surely appreciate if you would take one or half a dozen over there. So I've got a pile up there by the coffee pot. I also have the sign-up sheet if you would like to get our emails and I'm not currently getting them. Thank you all for coming and we will see you.